The theme for our final session this morning is engines of growth, with particular emphasis on the incredible explosion of resource projects currently underpinning much of Australia's economy, and the sorry picture of Australia's lagging infrastructure landscape and skills shortage that's uh, put in the spotlight. Our first speaker for this session knows the mining story from the inside. Sam Walsh is an executive director of Rio Tinto PIC and uh, PLC and uh, Rio Tinto Limited and chief executive of Rio Tinto Australia. Prior to his 20 years with Rio, uh, Sam notched up 20 years in the automotive industry, so his links to manufacturing go back 40 years. Would you please welcome Sam Walsh. Thank you, Kerry, and I'd like to thank uh, AIG for inviting me to uh, speak here today. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land. Australia is currently the beneficiary of continuing international demand for minerals, minerals of which we have large reserves. This much we all know. We're a lucky country, but I'm occasionally reminded of golfer Gary Player's famous response to a reporter's suggestion that he was enjoying some good fortune in his game. Yes, he said, the more I practice, the luckier I get. <laughs> I occasionally have to suppress a similar response when it suggested what good luck the mining sector is currently enjoying. Like player, the harder we work and the more we invest, the luckier we are getting too. What we are part of is a new new phase in global history, perhaps as, as significant and world-changing as the Industrial Revolution was in Europe and North America. To draw for a moment on that history, it's somewhat odd that much of what is written and taught about European industrialization is focused almost entirely on the negative aspects. Child chimney sweeps, pea soup smogs, primitive working conditions, subsistence wage wages, and dark satanic mills. All of this happened, it's true, but there's another side to this story. There's a reason that the rural poor left the land en masse and went to where the industry was. They were virtual slaves for centuries in feudal Europe before, before this upheaval. And whilst industrialization led to fortunes for industrialists and unprecedented, unprecedented economic uh, might, for the European powers. It also led in time to improve safety in factories and mines, better wages, mass opportunities for small entrepreneurs servicing the industrial titans, and crucially, massive investments in productivity, uh, capacity, and technology. And with it came political change, the rise of modern parties, legislated environmental protection, reforms in public health, and education, and inexorably rising levels of prosperity for everyone. It led to the democratic, educated, modern, thriving industrial societies that we all take for granted today. <coughs> Much of the rest of the world is now in the early stages of mimicking this rapid modernization, lifting vast populations from rural subsistence poverty to modern living standards. And we're fortunate to have the nations of Asia where this shift is happening most rapidly as our near neighbours. They are neighbours with whom Australia has nurtured strong cultural and trade relationships for many years. And as a result, we're not just witnessing the acceleration of this new industrial revolution at close quarters. We're up to our necks in it. We're supplying it, and it's not just commodities that Australia is contributing to this transformation. Through our education exports, we're helping to educate a new generation of engineers, scientists, doctors and managers, people who lead the next phase of this great modernising project for their own nations. And we're fortunate to live in a continent rich in the ores and energy sources that are being consumed by the Asian growth, growth economies in ever-increasing uh, quantities. Those economies are transforming these commodities into the building blocks of modernity, roads, railways, cities, housing, hospitals, energy supplies and telecommunication systems. And the Australian resources industry is at the forefront of this huge supply challenge. It's an industry engagement, indeed a national engagement, that's not short term 
is not trivial and is not merely a trade exchange empty of meaning. It is world changing. Decades from now, the world will look vastly different as a result of this frenetic development activity and life will be immeasurably better for many, many millions of people. Simultaneously, we're providing high paid employment for thousands of Australians, Australians large scale training programs for our skilled workforce, even larger scale revenue streams back to state and federal governments in the multiple forms of royalties and taxes that we contribute. It's a massive contribution to our nation's current prosperity and economic resilience. As well, many of us are reinvesting large proportions of our earnings into expanding capacity, knowing that if we don't have adequate future supply capacity, Australia has plenty of trading rivals who will happily take our place. A recent article in the Sydney Morning Herald by that paper's international editor, Peter Harcher, offered a little recent historical perspective. Harcher recalled an address by economist Ken Cortis to senior public servants in Canberra some time ago. He was invited to speculate on how he foresaw the next 10 years for the Australian economy. He predicted long-term building economic strength, led by our mining industries and eventually currency parity with the US dollars dollar by the, the decade's end. This seemed outlandish at the time since the Aussie was sitting at roughly 52 cents US at the time. That talk was 10 years ago. Asked recently how he sees the next decade, Archer quotes Cortis saying, we will look back and say to ourselves, why didn't we buy gold when it was only $1,900 an ounce? <laughs> in my business and those of many in this room, forecasts have to be backed up with serious large quantities of capital investment in order to realise the gains from a 10 or 20 year cycle of demand growth. Cycles that put bluntly can make such investments quite daunting when things do not look so rosy nor so certain. Times when investors become skittish, when prices hit south and when markets feel fragile. Ten years ago, when that prediction of a sustained mining boom was being made in Canberra, Rio Tinto's annual iron ore production in the Pilbara was around 72 million tonnes a year. Today, it's 225. In another four years, we'll reach 333 million tonnes a year. And it took Rio Tinto 25 years from when we first started mining to extract 1 billion tonnes of ore. We've now mined more than three, and our next billion will be extracted within three to four years. This gives you some sense of the scale of activity, but I want to stress that we are by no means alone in such achievements, and none of this has been achieved through a stroke of luck. It's simply what has been required to get our industry and our country into the international envied position that it enjoys today. It was Sir Isaac Newton who famously paid tribute to the scientific pioneers before him by saying, if I saw further, it was because I stood on the shoulders of giants. There's an analogy in Australia's mining sector at the start of the current decade. Rio Tinto and our colleagues in the mining extraction business and now producing at phenomenal rates to meet the growing demand of our markets. In order to do so, we're utilising plant and loading transport and port infrastructure that has to be seen to be fully appreciated. This scale of, of activity and capacity didn't appear just overnight. It stands on the shoulders of decades of work and vast investments that set it up. The wherewithal was built piece by piece over the preceding 25 years, years when prices were good and years when prices were not so good. Add to this the remoteness of mining sites from populations, workforce, suppliers, fabricators and even port facilities and you have another whole dimension of difficulty that, again, is hard to imagine unless you've travelled to these sites in person to see for yourself. And then there is the technical difficulty of extracting from ore bodies that are increasingly inaccessible or that we simply have been unable to get to or perhaps even discover when we first started. So there's an overlay of technology on all of this too. Technology which itself 
has required large-scale investments to develop and to perfect. In short, my business is one of complex logistics requiring integration across 14 lines, 1,400 kilometres of rail, <coughs> three ports, three power stations, as well as countless other infrastructure components. It's about people, product, efficiency, and customer delivery. Anyone who's visited our 500 person operations centre located at Perth Airport, from where we control all of this, some 1,500 kilometres from our Pilbara operations, will appreciate the complexity, the need for seamless integration, and the investment of money, expertise, ingenuity, and sheer effort. This long history of investment and considerable risks taken along the way is the reason that we're positioned where we are today, why Australia is positioned where it is relative to the, Australia, the Asian growth economies. For Australia, there will be some pain and readjustment associated with all the gains that we're enjoying as a nation in pole position at the great 21st century Asian boom. It's likely our dollar will remain strong with the detriment to the manufacturing industry, as we've heard, and export industries, as well as key sectors such as education and tourism. Lately, we've heard a good deal about these dangers with suggestions from some that what's required is punitive measures on the prospering sectors of, of our economy, such as mandated domestic procurement to artificially support others. Such analysis ignores the flow on benefits of the growth in the minerals sector. A recent report in the Australian points out that mining has grown from 5% to 10% of our economy in less than a decade, and describes Australia as having grabbed global first mover advantage in supplying the Asian surge. It goes on to cite Angus Taylor of Port Jackson Partners, depicting of our nation's emerging cluster of world-class resource-based services companies. This is a key truth in this discussion, for it's not just the thousands employed in our mines, railways, ports, and operations centre, nor is it just about the $5.1 billion that we at Rio Tinto alone contributed to the Australian government's taxes this last year. Around our industry's growing success is accumulating a large cluster of brilliant, world-leading and equally successful companies in engineering services, IT and other cutting-edge technology, explosives, chemicals, freight, contract mining, as well as financial, legal, accounting and related service industries, all now highly geared to an expert in servicing and support of mining. The recent ANZ Port Jackson Partners report talks of an ec economic transformation of Australia, generating half a trillion dollars in exports and three quarters of a million new jobs over the next two decades. It predicts employment in resource-related industries to more than double to around 1.45 million in that period. So whilst there's undoubted problems associated with a strong dollar and structural adjustment within our economy, these are problems most developed nations on earth right now would gladly have. Returning to a moment to the broad sweep of history, we know that there'll be ups and downs. There'll be commodity price volatility and wages and inflationary pressure, pressures. But the longer term tread is there for all to see. The Asian giants to our north are well placed on their own industrialization and urbanization great strides in modernizing their economies and with it, their societies. Their populations are energized by this change and driving it even faster. And this process will not be stopped. And following China, there's other emerging economies, India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Africa, the South African countries, each of which has a society ambitious to make its own transition. Whatever peaks and troughs the coming decades hold, huge parts of the world will be rebuilt brand new. The Australian minerals industry will certainly contribute a great deal of the raw materials that are required for this phenomenal and historic reconstruction. The ANZ Port, Jackness, Port Jackson Partners report I mentioned earlier counsels strongly against urges to run interference with 
or to try to artificially to slow this cycle of prosperity. It warns Australia must guard against lucky country complacency. Yes, we must, but I also believe it is important we realise that no one sector can nation build by itself. We understand how best to form partnerships. We must make these partnerships work across the sectors, public, commercial and social. It's also about ensuring we maintain a predictable platform for investment decision making, where new policy changes or legislative frameworks don't catch us by surprise and unnecessarily impact on our ability to compete internationally. The positives and negatives of strong growth are very real and require steady hands on the policy levers. Industry, government, our workforce and our investors all have roles to play in keeping our business strong, our econo econo economic fundamentals stable, and in order to protect Australia's good fortune in the decades ahead. And Rio Tinto and other companies in Australia's mineral sector have worked extremely hard for a long time to get this lucky, and we don't intend to ease up now. Thank you. Sam, uh, you've just come back from uh, the US and Britain. How would you describe the investment climate and, uh, and how does that potentially impact on you? Yeah, look, I, I, I met with uh, a range of investors on the west coast of the USA and I've got to say that these guys are more worried about their jobs than what I physically had to say. But, but certainly uh, they, they see the ongoing promise that uh, China and Asia bring to us. I, I think uh, perspective on, on their economy, I, I'm, I'm an optimist about uh, the Americans. I believe that they will pull themselves out of it. I suspect the three to five years that we're talking about is, is probably accurate. But there are a lot of people working hard to, uh, to turn that, that big ship. Europe, I think, is a different matter. I, I think that there are some structural problems in relation to uh, uh, the EU. Um, certainly Greece, Italy, Portugal. Um, I don't know what sort of adjustment there'll, there'll need to be in relation to uh, uh, EU membership and so on, but you know, it, it is hard physically for those countries to adjust when they, they don't actually have control of, of uh, their, their currency, which is uh, an important measure for them. Uh, fortunately, from uh, our viewpoint, uh, I ship very, very little in, into Europe, and I ship <laughs> nothing to Greece, so fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. Sam, I'll, I'll get you to stay, because uh, maybe there'll be a minute or two, and uh, what uh, an guest has to say also has bearing on your own perspectives. Peter Brecht is um, Managing Director of Infrastructure for the uh, construction giant.